everyone and welcome to another Heritage Live. My name is Joelle Waminga and I am the Operations Coordinator here at Coquitlam Heritage. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that we once again will be doing another uh, question and answer at the end of the Heritage Live. So if you are joining over Zoom, there is a button just down at the bottom uh, that says Q&A and you're welcome to post any questions in there. And if you're joining on Facebook Live, you can feel free to just post your questions in the comment section and I'll keep my eye out for those. Uh, and we'll be able to ask all of those questions once the uh, lecture talk is finished. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we have Jasmine Moore, one of our uh, curators here at Coquitlam Heritage uh, to share some uh, information and show you some of the different cars and roadsters and stuff that we have in our collection. Uh, so I will turn everything over to Jasmine now. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Jasmine Moore, as Joelle said, uh, the Collections Curator and Heritage Manager here at uh, Mackin House. Um, we are here today to look at roadsters and jalopies from the cars in our collection. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, I hope you learned something new. I would like to start off by pointing out that I am not a car expert, but I'm going to do my best. Um, with me, as always, is the wonderful and talented Miggy Ferreira. So thank you, Miggy, for your help today. Now, some of you may be wondering what exactly a jalopy or a roadster is. I usually get a lot of confused looks when I use these terms uh, nowadays. So uh, first, we're going to look at a roadster. So this is a roadster. It's usually a car that is uh, only two seats and it's convertible. Um, we may have additional seating in the back. Uh, usually we call that a rumble seat. So where the trunk would be, that may pop open and then you could fit extra people in there. Um, the touring, a touring car would be kind of the counter component when, when cars were first introduced, uh, but they usually have uh, two sets of seats in the car. So that's, uh, that's a roadster. Um, so there you go, there's our first one. And a jalopy is something that, you know, if you, read the Archie comic books back in the day, you would probably know what that is. It's a car that's usually in a constant state of disrepair. Um, here we have uh, an old uh, comic book cover featuring Archie and Betty. And actually Archie's jalopy, uh, the name for it was Betsy. Um, and it started out based on a Model T Ford uh, or a Model A. And it later was quoted as being a Ford Chevy Plymouth Pierce Arrow, Packard, DeSoto, Hudson, due to the fact that it had been made from uh, various car parts that were salvaged out of um, junkyards. So, uh, poor old Betsy was destroyed in 1983 in an issue of Life with Archie. In later issues, he drives a 1960s Ford Mustang, uh, but it's still never really reliable for poor old Archie. So, uh, other words for a jalopy include, you know, a beater or a clunker, a rust bucket, a lemon, a wreck, or a death trap. And these cars were kind of, they came to be because um, they, you know, during the Great Depression, many people had to just drive their cars really into the ground uh, rather than uh, buy new cars. And, you know, so there was a lot of cars at that time that were kind of clunkers <laughs> on the road. So uh, we're going to show you a few uh, cars that are kind of inspired by uh, jalopy shapes like the Model A, Model T. So there you go. And with that, let's get out of my dreams and into my cars. So our first example is this uh, piece here. And this is the uh, Touring Limo by George, George's Caret & Co. And it dates to between 1905 and 1911. Um, the company that produced this was founded in 1886. And uh, George Caret originally partnered with Adolf and Ignaz, Ignaz Bing. Uh, and he worked with a, uh, as a partner with them producing a lot of materials for their company and they would they would sell the pieces on, on behalf of him. Uh, in 1895, their partnership was dissolved and George went on to find, found his own company. Uh, he produced and manufactured tin plate toys, steam powered models, magic lanterns, other materials made from lithograph sheet metal. So he it, produced really early lithograph uh, sheet metal toys. Um, in 1896, George opened a shop with Paul Joseph Thal and their partnership went well with the exception of a factory fire in 1903. As a French national living in Nuremberg, uh, problems with, arose with the onset of World War I um, as his assets were likely to be seized by the German government. And in fact, his factory was put into administration in 1914. George and his wife returned to France and the, the entire factory was unfortunately liquidated in 1916 due to wartime legislation. The German government uh, proceeded to sell off the company assets, including all the designs and tooling. His, this particular limo 
reflects uh, disparate cultural norms of the time. Uh, the owner of this toy would have been from the upper crust of society, uh, where it was common to own a car with the driver and you would have somebody drive you around. Um, there's a lot of detail to this piece. However, we are missing uh, some, some pieces. So there would be uh, headlights on the front here, and there was actually gas lanterns on either side of the windshield. Uh, the rack on the, the roof uh, indicates that it's a touring car. So it's something that you would take on long trips uh, or visit, visits to the country to you know, have your social tea, uh, et cetera, at this time. It has working doors. They actually open backwards to what we're used to today. And there's real glass inset in you know, the windshield and the sides of the vehicle as well. So it's overall a very deluxe to uh, toy made for a very wealthy child. And it is a wind up toy. Um, so we have the back here, there's, there's a little uh, clockwork mechanism. So you would wind that up and it would go. So there's our first toy. And next we have two examples um, you may or may not remember in our last presentation, we talked about uh, Dayton toys. So uh, these are toys that come out of Dayton, Ohio, and they, they, they have a mechanism at the bottom. And so when you pull it back and let it go, it'll climb on its own. Uh, these are known as hill climber toys. Um, this example here uh, is the older example of the two, uh, the one that has the cart on the back. And we have one that's a little more modern. So I think that this, this example dates to maybe circa 1890, 1900. And uh, they are both made by the DP Clark and company, I believe. Uh, apparently DP Clark toys are identifiable because they have a large uh, flywheel on, in the middle of the toy. And um, both of these have that. Also DP Clark uses a lot of wood in the base of his toys and the example uh, over here with the, the cart is, it has a lot of wood in the actual uh, frame making up the coach. So a bit about uh, Dayton Toys. So they were in, originally patented by the Boyers in 1897. And he patented the flywheel mechanism on the inside of a heavy sheet metal toy and called them Dayton Toys. Uh, Boyer partnered with David uh, Patrick, David Parker Clark, sorry, um, in about 1897 and together they produce the hill climber toys. So we'll have more examples of those in future episodes um, <laughs> coming up, uh, especially the Polar Express, we'll have some uh, examples of trains as well. Uh, so they went into business and then uh, I think Boyer passed away. And so uh, DP Clark partnered instead with uh, Schieble and uh, Clark actually ended up leaving the company in the early 1900s. Shibley she continued to make toys under his own name and Clark actually decided to get back into the business because he realized that it was quite lucrative, I believe. And they ended up uh, fighting each other for years and years and years over the rights to the patent of the flywheel. So there's, there's always slightly uh, different in the way that they construct the toys. Um, and yeah, the DP Clark toys date from about 1880 to 1905 and Dayton and Shibley produced cars uh, into the 1930s. So when D.P. Clark got back into the business, he produced toys under the Dayton name instead of D.P. Clark. So there are those two examples of early cars. Thank you. Okay, and next we have a uh, Shibla toy, another Shibla toy, and this one does have the flywheel mechanism uh, located on the back end here, but it's quite small and it's kind of been enclosed. So we know that this is a later model. Uh, it dates to about 1924. Uh, this is made from pressed steel and it's been painted dark blue. So we have four white uh, rubber wheels here. And they actually say Firestone on them and Shibla toy. So that's how we know that it's a Shibla. And the, they were produced from 1909 to 1931. And this is a friction flywheel and I believe this is uh, patterned after a Packard. So if you look at this picture, it's pretty close. <laughs> uh, it has, Packards have the very distinctive uh, longer front end and the grill on the front as well is, is quite distinctive. So that is our 1924 uh, Press Steel Packard Roadster. 
and I say roadster because they were later enclosed with the roof uh, towards the 20s and into the 30s. And next we have, this is a Wilkins sedan from about 1925. It's also press steel. Now, um, if I'm really open, if anybody has any information, I believe this is a Wilkins because it, the front end is very, very similar to uh, some of the Wilkins buses uh, that I've been able to locate. And we actually have one in our, our collection as well. Um, and it also was identified as that when it was uh, first accessioned into the collection. So Wilkins, our manufacturer is based out of Keene, New Hampshire. Um, it was founded in about 1890. He was one of the earliest to produce toy cars, uh, maybe as early as 1895. This car also has a friction motor right at the back here. And it actually says uh, patent November 1st and it's made in the USA. Um, the company first produced toy clothes ringers for children, for little girls, and a series of cast iron toys that were mostly horse-drawn carriages and other vehicles. Uh, they, the company was bought out by actually Harry, Harry T. Kingsbury. So you may remember we had a Kingsbury truck uh, in our last presentation and he was a farm equipment manufacturer, um, but they carried on the Wilkins name uh, in a line of toys until the end of World War I, about 1919. And they made a lot of horse-drawn vehicles together. They also made cook stoves, circus toy wagons. Uh, during World War II, the company branched out and had to, you know, make do. So they made rifle bolt, bolts instead of toys. Uh, so yeah, that's our uh, Wilkins sedan from about 1925. So thank you. Now, next we're gonna talk a little bit about race cars. So we have a few examples here. And see that here, I'll bring that back just a tiny bit. There we go. <laughs> okay, um, so since the 20th century, toy cars have developed alongside their real life counterparts. So they really do reflect, you know, the, the cars that are uh, being produced at a certain period in time. Um, so they reflect the economic and technological trends of any particular era. In the 20th century, wood and, wood and cast iron were the most popular materials as die cast cars were still in their infancy. Uh, that, that usually you know, die-cast cars really surged in popularity in about the 1950s and onwards. Uh, rubber was not quite durable enough. Um, it, you know, there was problems trying to get it to the right consistency so it wasn't too hard. However, uh, the end of the Second World War led to a po post-war boom, uh, baby boom and economic boom, which coincided with new technological breaks breakthroughs uh, in die-cast, including Zamac, which we talked about last time, vulcanized rubber and more durable plastics. So a new wealthier consumer market uh, and rapidly improving lifestyle produced a demand for mass produced toys as there was more leisure time and, and kids really could work less and play more. So companies turned to the uh, cheaper, more durable and flexible materials as opposed to wood and cast iron. Um, although rubber did not remain very popular, we have one example of a rubber car and it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, uh, die cast and plastic toys were more popular uh, towards you know the latter half of the 20th century. So anyway, uh, moving on, we are going to talk about these uh, race cars. So uh, the first one here is a cast iron race car. So it has a seam running down the center of it. So we know it's cast iron. And I believe it's a Hublé from about you know 1925 to 1930. Uh, it was Hublé was incorporated in 1894 by John Hubley and the first cast iron toys uh, he produced started around 1909. Uh, casting for uh, something made of cast iron went as follows. So wood form was carved, a basic design was hammered out in metal and then the metal was pressed into the wooden form um, into highly compacted sand which created an impression for the molding and then they would pour molten um, iron into the mold and they were usually formed in two pieces and then the two pieces were bolted together. And this is a perfect example of that. There is a bolt on one side and right here, if you can see that. And then underneath you can see it running uh, from one side to the other. So uh, this car, I believe is based on a, just hold it, uh, a Ford Model A boat tail speedster or a 1928 Packard boat tail speedster. So uh, racing was really big in the 1930s, um, especially, you know, the early 1930s. 
and every little boy wanted a race car. So we have quite a few examples of that. It's, it's really a reflection of what was going on in the world at the time. Um, so this car had a three-speed manual transmission, three and a half liter engine, rear, and it was operated by rear wheel drive. And the boat tail on the end here is meant to reduce drag on the track. And I just have an example of uh, kind of a similar uh, vehicle to this one, which you can see they, they are very similar. This has the, you know, the, oh, sorry, <laughs> the narrower point on the back. And then it's got the very kind of flat front end. Um, so there's that one. And next we're going to talk about this big guy and he is also a hoobly and it, it's called the Red Devil uh, sports car. It's cool if you lift up the uh, flap, you can see the engine underneath. And uh, in addition to cars, Hoobly also made horse-drawn uh, vehicles, tractors, steam shovels, fire engines, banks, and guns. Uh, they attempted to get into the model train business, but failed and sold off their stock. The company uh, changed hands several times, but is still producing high-end model kits today. So why this is called the Red Devil is because of this gentleman here. His name is Camille Gen Genetzi, uh, and he was one of the first and most successful uh, race car drivers of the early 20th century. Uh, in addition to breaking the land speed record three times, he also was the first man to break the 100 kilometer an hour uh, barrier. He had a pointed beard and he usually wore a flowing duster coat uh, and goggles, which created a really distinctive look. He also had brilliant red hair, flaming, flaming red hair. Uh, in 1903, he raced in the Gordon Bennett Cup uh, in Ireland behind the wheel of a Mercedes. So I think that's this one on this side. Um, and he reportedly predicted that he would die behind the wheel of a Mercedes due to the deadly nature of racing at the time. Around 1909, uh, so here we have an advertisement uh, featuring the Red Devil by Bosch. Uh, and this one is for spark plugs. Uh, around 1909, he began uh, a partnership with them and they started, these kind of advertisements started to appear and the, it referenced his preference. He really liked Bosch ignition, ignition systems in his race cars. Um, uh, it became a major marketing slogan for the company and these would appear like in life size uh, at trade shows and it was part of their first major campaign. After World War I, the uh, branches in the United States were actually taken over by the American Bosch company, but it was originally a German company. So here we go. There's our Red Devil race car. And then next we have this one, which um, <clears throat> I believe to be a Hoogly. I was able to find a, a couple of cars that were very similar. This is actually made from cast aluminum and it has on the inside, it says uh, patent pending, so pat pend. And the versions that I was able to find on online actually have uh, rubber wheels, but these are wooden. So I think it might be, you know, an, a really early kind of prototype car from the 1930s. And it is meant to be representative of the uh, Indy 500 uh, race cars, which were open and they had open wheelbase. Um, the Indy, Indy track was actually built in 1909 and the first Indy race was held in 1911 and was won, won by Ray Haroon. So there is our next race car. And now we're gonna get into the land speed racers. So we have this very large example and this is the Silver Bullet racing car by Buffalo Toys. It dates again to about 1930. Uh, so Buffalo, New York was the eighth largest city in the US in the early 1900s. And it was famous for having more millionaire, millionaires per capita than any other city in the US. There were several toy companies active in this area in the early 1900s because there was a lot more money to go around and a lot more money for leisure and for you know kids to have things to play with. So I think this is a Buffalo toy and tool works toy, <laughs> uh, which dates to about, they, they were in operation from 1924 to 1968. Uh, they manufactured lightweight lithographed pressed steel mechanical toys. The owner was Frank R. Labin, and Labin held multiple patents. Uh, he created many toys using one of these patents, which is featured on this particular vehicle, uh, in which uh, the toy is activated by a spring on the inside. So you pull back this 
this lever on the back and then it makes it go. He also incorporated this into carousels as well. Uh, so the company focused on building the toy version of the fastest car of the day. Um, apparently the drivers of these cars were fearless and were so used to escaping death on a daily basis that it was just all in a day's work. Uh, the silver bullet car was driven by K. Don in 1930 uh, and it was sponsored by Sunbeam. During the 1930s, race car drivers were usually not alone in their vehicles. So you'll see there's, uh, there's two people here. Um, and that was because, you know, the, the second person would help with navigation or any repairs to the vehicle when they were uh, racing around the track. And cars were tested at Daytona Beach in Florida due to the flat ground and a lot of sand that made it easy to drive really fast on. Although this car looks really impressive, it didn't achieve any records, unfortunately. Uh, March 27, 1930 was the first trial run. It was powered by two engines, which would have been uh, like back to back here in the front end. Hence why the car is so long. Uh, it was, the two engines were required because if they had to use one to get the horsepower that they wanted to achieve, it would have been too high and too wide. Um, so it was also featured an 11.5 cubic foot tank that was filled with 280 kilograms of ice to cool the engine. So uh, it was, you know, a pretty archaic but very sophisticated for the time. Um, so uh, the seats required the arms be kept inside the vehicle because if they were to put their arms outside the vehicle while racing at the speeds they hoped to achieve, their arms would be ripped off. Um, so the car was built in 1929 uh, as the last record set by Sunbeam, which was 200 miles per hour, uh, first set in 1927, had been broken in 1929 by a comp competitor. So they built the car uh, capable of reaching a speed of 250 miles per hour. That's 400 roughly 400 kilometers an hour. Uh, the first test went really badly as the car was difficult to control and the engine was unreliable. So they only actually reached a speed of 186 miles per hour, which is roughly 300 kilometers per hour. They didn't even break the records that they had set previously. Unfortunately, the company barely recovered from the Great War and with this kind of defeat alongside the onset of the Great Depression, Sunbeam Aero engines went out of business in 1935. The car was sold to a hotel, hotelier and a garage owner who attempted to beat the records on Southport Beach, but he could not get the engine to cooperate and the car was eventually scrapped, unfortunately. So that's our, our silver bullet race car. And next, we have our rocket racer, which is obviously inspired by the same shape as the silver bullet car. And this is made by Marks and Company. Um, you can see on the back end, there's the logo. And this is a tin plate lithograph um, from about 1935. Uh, Lewis Marks, you may remember from our previous uh, episode, uh, it was American toy manufacturer. They were in business from about 1919 to 1980. They were founded in New York. Uh, the company's basic aim was to give the customer more toy for less money. Marks operated numerous plants overseas, and in 1955, five percent of their of the toys sold in the U.S. actually came out of Japan. So this toy was marketed to be as fast as lightning and the car of the future. Uh, one of it was one of Marks Company's most popular tin uh, clockwork race toys or race cars. Sorry, it sold for 25 cents when it first uh, came out, which was apparently more affordable for a lot of Depression era children. Uh, one out of five toys sold in the mid-1950s, mid mid-20th century, came out of a Marks and Company factory. He was also known as the Toy King. Uh, he offered toys that were very similar to those produced by other companies, so there was a lot of copying going on, but he changed just enough to avoid being accused of copying, and he often undercut the prices of his competitors, which, you know, contributed to his, his success. Uh, he often used the same body or tooling for multiple, but he, multiple toys, but he just kind of altered the design slightly uh, every year. So it would appear like there was a new car that you had to have, um, but it was not that different from the ones that were released previously. Company revenues actually started to rise during the Great Depression, which was quite uh, unusual at that time and very unique. So uh, we're going to talk more about him uh, later on as well, but here is our rocket racer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, and next we have this guy. He's a tiny little short racer. 
And he actually, it's a roadster with a rumble seat in the back, an enclosed roadster from about 1930. And I think it was based on this car here, which is the uh, Ford Model A Deluxe with the option to add the rumble seat in the back. And this is produced by YN Dot Toys, so you may remember them again from last, last time. They were a major uh, competitor of Mark's. Um, they were also known as the All Metal Products Company, and they were in business from 1921 to about 1957. They manufactured millions of toys across the globe. This is a, a pressed steel car. Um, beginning in 1921, they focused on toy guns, so you may remember that. Uh, Everybody wants a pop gun was one of their slogans. And then later they changed their slogan to Hawaiian dot toys are good and safe, probably because there was some issues there. Uh, early on, they manufactured really simple, streamlined uh, Art Deco inspired steel cars and trucks, and they were very distinctive in their appearance. So, you know, this is, is very simple. It's made from a very few pieces of uh, sheet metal that have been bent to the shape. So post-war sales with uh, soared with an incoming baby boom, and they reached 8 million uh, in 1948. A change in management in the 1950s actually led to a fall in sales, though. Uh, in the 1950s, toys been, began to be manufactured in plastic in an attempt to compete with dime store and bargain basement uh, competition. And eventually, the company sold a portion of its product line, including uh, their uh, popular Hafner train line, to its competitor, Lewis Marks & Company. Uh, final closure of the remaining Wyandotte plant in 1955, and the comp company unfortunately went bankrupt in 1957. So toys made before 1947 are really simple in construction and usually feature bright colors like this one. Uh, and post-war toys are usually distinguishable because of their detailed lithograph prints and the thinner metal, resulting in a lighter product. So there's our Wyandotte Roadster. Uh, okay, so next we have uh, Wolverine Supply Company uh, mystery car, and this is a, a tin lithograph car, very early tin lithograph car uh, in red uh, from about 1930 again. So the Wolverine Supply Company was founded in Pittsburgh in 1903 to about 1950. 1950. Early toys were set in motion uh, by the weight of marbles or sand. Uh, in 1918, Wolverine's line expanded to include girls' toys, such as tea sets, toy washing machines, glass washboards, etc. Uh, by 1929, they were producing airplanes, boats, and buses, and cars. They continued to expand their toy lines through the 1930s, right up to the beginning of World War II. This is a model, this car is modeled after a 1936 Pontiac. Um, it is a lithograph body with, you know, there's a little bit of raised detail uh, for the front grille, but otherwise, the detail is just achieved by the lithograph. Um, the side reads mystery car and it says press down here right on the trunk. This is one of the only cars to operate using a self winding clockwork motor. So by pressing down here on the back, uh, that would actually wind up the motor so the car would go. So it was marketed as no winding, no battery, no key, what makes it run? Um, this is one of the only cars that had this feature at that time and it was good but it was also not so good because you know kids and it, all it takes is one really hard press and the car would be broken unfortunately. In the UK the um, Marks company so they as I said earlier they're they're notorious for copying they produced models inspired by this car known as the Marks you drive it car or the Marks reversible coupe and the bodies of these cars are almost exact copies of each other. Um, this it, car has details inspired by kind of art deco there's very long sleek lines and it's, uh, the doors actually open backward, which is quite different from what we see today. And you can see um, on the side there, there's two bolts and indicating, if you could see that, I hope you can see it maybe in the pictures, um, that the, the door would open this way. So there we go, that's that one. And next, we have a big one. <laughs> and this is by Core Core. Uh, toys, and this is the Graham sedan dating to about 1932. So this is a pressed steel toy, and I'm pretty sure uh, it has been sandblasted, uh, so the original co color is no longer a part of the toy. Um, it actually has these, if you can see on the front end, there's uh, glass light bulbs, uh, working headlights there, and it, there's a spare tire on the trunk, which says Corcor 
toys on it. Um, so core, it was also known as core, core and metal products. And they were founded in Washington, Indiana, uh, in operation from about 1925 to 1941. Most of the toys they produced were large toys. Uh, so what's a Graham sedan? Graham was an autom automobile manufacturing company uh, that was founded by two brothers, Joseph B. Graham and Robert C. Graham around 1919. In 1921, they struck a deal and began using uh, Dodge engines and drivetrains exclusively, uh, selling their trucks at Do Dodge dealerships. They left Dodge abruptly in 1926. In 1927, they partnered with the Page Detroit Motor Company, offering six to eight cylinder engine cars. And I believe that this particular vehicle is inspired by the Graham Blue Streak, which was revolutionary at the time as it innovated a lot on the body of a vehicle. So the fenders were actually enclosed. So, you know, before it was usually quite open and you could see all the mud and grime and things that that would kind of accumulate uh, around the tires. And they actually moved the radiator cap under the hood. The body was overall more smooth and rounded and uh, they concealed part of the chassis, especially near the rear of the vehicle. Uh, they redesigned the cars again in 1935. So Graham produced more supercharged cars than any other manufacturer until Buick surpassed them in the 1990s. So that is our core core Graham sedan. And I believe that this is actually may or may not be a model that was produced uh, for a dealership as like a, a selling feature because I found a few others that and they were marketed that way. So um, may or may not be. If you know, you can let me know. And it's cool. There's a little switch here on the side to turn the lights on and off. So that's a pretty early uh, invention for, you know, that time period. So there's that. Thank you. Okay, next. Just this one. So we have a bit of a set here and I'll kind of pull the pieces out. So this is a wind up car by Shuko and it dates to about 1938. It's a teeny tiny car and there's a hole on the top here where you would put the key to wind it or no, sorry, this is the telesteering car. So <laughs> this is a very complex system. So there's these wires here, which come with the toy and our instructions. And then we have this cool little steering wheel. So the idea is that you would uh, hook the, the wire from here to the car, and then you could steer the car remotely. And on the hood of the car, there's several different speeds that you could set it at. And this is very distinctive of a Shuko is this, you know, black with that very bright kind of, this, in this case, it's cream colored, but it could be white. Um, and the, the name and then the model. So this is the Shuko 3000. And um, the, a little bit about the company. So the company was founded in 1912 by Heinrich uh, Mueller and Heinrich Schreier in the toy capital of Germany, which is Nuremberg. You may remember that from last time. Uh, Mueller was a model maker. He developed a strong reputation as a man who could not only invent, but design a toy and the machinery and tooling to build it. So they became a legendary, legendary for innovative mechanisms. And we have several Shuko cars to show you today uh, that were also worthy of play. So they were pretty durable uh, and a powerhouse for toy production from about the 1930s to 1950s. They made cars in tin, plastic, and also die cast cars. The company went bankrupt in 1976, uh, but they reorganized in 1993 and went independent by about 1996. Uh, so you can actually still buy Shuko models today online if you're interested. And the uh, Mueller bought out Schreier after World War One, and the name was changed to Shuko, which stands for sh sh for Schreier and Co, which is and Co, so Shuko. Um, they were very famous early on for their pick pick bird, so they made a lot of clockwork toys uh, at first, like wind up mice and a dancing mouse and a dog that trotted. Uh, in 1935, they introduced their first patented motor cars. And this is the 1938 telesteering car. Um, so they ended many of their cars with an O. So other names include Studio, Piccolo, and Varianto. And we have an Ingenico that we'll show you later. Uh, with World War II, obviously toy production stopped. In the late 1940s, they began to make tin toys for a broader European market. 
in the 1940s, they shifted to uh, plastic, especially for the larger cars. The first die cast cars uh, also entered production at this time. In 1976, they were purchased by a British company and they didn't produce uh, die cast models at this time. So this is the Shuko 3000 and it's kind of like an early remote control car, but you know, you're still, uh, you're still, you're still attached to it, but it, it was probably really revolutionary and very cool at the time. Um, so there's also a set of accessories that come with this car. You can probably see on there two boys. They've got it kind of set up and they're running through the cones. So I just picked out a couple to show you. So we have a red and a green, or sorry, yellow and a green and a red. Um, and then there's this little wooden, sorry, wooden ball as well. Um, so we're very lucky to have it. Uh, it's, you know, pretty unusual to get the boxes with, with a lot of toys. Um, so whenever that happens, I get excited. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that one. And let's put these back. Oh, I'm missing. Okay, so next is this one, which is pretty simple. I don't really have a lot to say about it, <laughs> but it is, uh, it is made in US zone Germany, and it's just a small um, tin, tin plate lithographed car. All, it's one piece really with, um, you know, there's the addition of the uh, fender and the bumper, um, and it's probably got a, a, a friction mechanism in it. So if you were to pull it back, it would fly off the table. And it says made in US zone Germany. So um, toys marketed with, with that range and date from about 1945 until 1952. And they're really highly sought after toys. Um, so there's, there's a small kind of example for you. And next we have the, this one, which is uh, also by Hoogly. And this is a little bit later. So it's about 1955 to 1962. And we know it's Hoogly because on the underside here, you can see uh, it says uh, Hoogly Kitty Lancaster, California, kind of California, uh, made in USA. And then the car, like the model number 432. So this is a convertible red roadster uh, with a silver, silver front end. And then there's a spare tire on the back and black detailing on the seats. And you may notice that it actually has the uh, driver's side is, is on the wrong side, or maybe the right side, depending on what country you're tuning in from. Uh, but this would indicate that the, this would be driven in Europe. Um, and I believe the car is, it is modeled after is this one, which is a uh, MG Roadster in the T-Series. Uh, so it's a post-war model because, you know, as we were talking about earlier, people had a lot more leisure time on their hands and they thought a lot of people thought the thrill of racing on the weekends. Uh, the first MG Roadsters were released in 1949. Uh, many were built for uh, the left-hand driving as per American standards and demand for the car kind of grew higher with it every year. Um, Two-seater sports cars were really popular between 1936 and 1955. And I think this might be a 1953 uh, midget, but I could be wrong. Who knows? So there you go. There's our uh, Hoogly uh, Roadster. 